Today, we're going to be learning how to plan a Google site. We'll be talking about different ways you can use sites in your classroom, walking through the planning process together, and talking about different resources you can use during this phase. My name is Rebecca Simons, and welcome to the Educate community. Planning the purpose of your site, the content you're going to provide, and how that content's going to be organized is arguably the most important part of designing your site. To guide our discussion today, we're going to be using a planning page that I developed. If you're participating in our badge course, then you already have a copy of this in Google Classroom. If you found this video through a Google search, then feel free to download a copy of the planning page linked in the description below. Let's start with talking about purpose and audience. One of the most common purposes for a Google site is a classroom or a grade level web page. Closely connected to purpose is audience. Who's going to be visiting your site? Who are you building it for? For example, if you're building a class or a grade level site, are you building it for parents, students, or both? Now you might be thinking, I already have a Google Classroom. Why would I wanna take the time to build and maintain a Google site as well? Well, the short answer is the Google Classroom is great at handing out assignments, collecting, and grading. But at the end of the day, it's meant for your students, not your families. A site can serve as a central hub for your families, providing them with information, resources, and a window into your classroom. Depending on how you choose to use it, your site could also serve as a hub for your students. Now, classroom or grade level sites typically fall into one of three categories, static, semi-static, or curricular. And these categories are based on the type of content the site provides and how often that site will need to be maintained. The first level is static. This means you use your site to share out information that doesn't change. Some examples might be contact information, class schedules, rules and expectations, etc. You could also provide access to frequently used links and educational resources. This type of site is perfect for beginners because it requires minimal updating. You might only update it once a semester or even once a year. This is a sample static site that I mocked up for this module, and the content I chose to include simply needs to be revisited before the start of each school year, unless there's a significant change mid-year. The homepage on this site features custom navigation buttons that can be used to link viewers to different pages on the site, like an About Me section or a Daily Schedule section. The second level is semi-static. At this level, you can still share static information, but you're also going to include information that changes periodically. This might include announcements about upcoming events, schedule changes, class news, photos, etc. This type of site is going to require more maintenance, probably at least once a week. On this site mockup, I chose to include an example of a living calendar. This is an embedded Google slide deck, which means that any changes I make on the slide deck are automatically shown on my site without me ever having to publish my changes. Families can also interact with it. They can scroll between different months, or if I had content hyperlinked, they'd be able to click on and interact with it. I also chose to include a class newsletter section. I think it's really useful to have a consistent place where families know they can come for information. That doesn't mean you shouldn't send information out in email as well, you should. But as a parent, I get emails for both my kids every day. And sometimes it becomes really frustrating trying to remember which email contained the one piece of information that I'm searching for. And sometimes it can become a full-on scavenger hunt. The third level is curricular. This type of site can contain information from the previous two levels, but it will also include things like your daily agenda, lesson resources, links to Google Classroom assignments, etc. 
If you're using your site to organize your curricular resources, your site should start becoming the hub or the starting place for your students with Google Classroom strictly being used for them to get their assignments and turn them back in. Google Classroom is a powerhouse at those tasks, but it's really limited on how you can visually package information and resources. I've included a sample slide deck here from my son's fourth grade teacher, and the second I saw it, I knew I had to include it. Her slides provide students with their learning target, the agenda, and all of her resources they're going to be using in class are hyperlinked. Now, an alternative would be for you to link the resources on the side. I've even included an example of how you could use a button to link students directly to their Google Classroom assignment. If I were to click on this button, it would open the specific assignment that I want them to work on. To grab a link for a specific assignment, all you have to do is hover over the assignment, click the More button, and click Copy Link. When students click on this link, they'll be brought directly to the assignment you want them to work on, which decreases the, I can't find it, what were we supposed to be working on? Comments that we're all so familiar with in class. The sky is really the limit on how you can choose to package content for your students, but the more we can keep our students in one location, and highly structure how we want them to go through our resources, the less distracted and the more successful they're going to be. Now, if you're willing to commit to frequently updating your site, this opens up an amazing opportunity to include your students in generating content for your site. When you involve your students in producing content for your site, not only does it give them an authentic audience, but it also gives them an authentic purpose for their work. As a former reading teacher, I would make sure to have a section on my site where students could write up their own book reviews and recommendations, which provides them an opportunity to practice their literary analysis skills. I also had a colleague who had her students write blog posts. A fun idea with this would be to have guest writers of the week featured on your site. Sites can also be used for a shorter time frame when you're using them for the purpose of curriculum delivery and support. This type of site is used for a specific purpose. Maybe you're setting up independent learning tracks, web quests, breakout rooms, project-based learning, or student portfolios. With the exception of portfolios, these type of sites are only used for a short time frame, like a single lesson or a unit. Here's a sample of a student portfolio template, which is an amazing way for students to showcase their growth and gives them a dedicated space to reflect on their learning throughout the year. Uh, this one has a specific section for student goals, monthly reflections, and a data notebook. Finally, another possible purpose for your site is a teacher dashboard. A dashboard is simply a place where you can store links, embedded slide decks, Google Forms, lesson plans, seating charts, whatever content you are using on a daily basis and you wanna have quick access to. Now, I've seen dashboards in just about every platform you can imagine, from sheets to slides to Symbaloo, but what I love about having a dashboard in sites is that you can integrate content from a variety of mediums. When I was preparing for this course, I wanted to try out building a dashboard, so I built one specifically for work, so I had access to all the resources that I use every day. You can even embed entire file structures, giving you quick access to locations in your drive you're always in. If you're interested in adding this kind of feature to your site, make sure to check out our advanced sites tips and tricks video. Once you've decided on the purpose and audience of your site, you are ready to start looking for inspiration. If you're part of the badge course, I'll provide you with several sites to look through to help provide inspiration. Try to find websites that have a similar purpose to yours and jot down notes as you explore them. What did the sites do well? What did you not like? Was it easy to navigate and find information? 
I also like to take screenshots of fun design elements or layouts so I can reference them while I'm building my site. Next, you want to start brainstorming how your site will be organized and what resources will be housed under each page. For example, on my home page, I might want to include navigation buttons, my living calendar, and photos of my classroom. Don't be afraid to spend quite a bit of time in this section. On the planning page, I tried to give you a jump start by listing resource ideas. Now these are specific for a class or maybe a grade level website, and the resources are grouped together by the three levels, static, semi-static, and curricular. If you find you need more rows, simply click in the last box and hit the tab key. Next, you wanna decide on a color scheme for your site. Websites tend to have one or two primary colors and a couple of accent colors. Too many colors on your site can become overwhelming and distracting. Colors should be used to help guide viewers' eyes to the most important parts of your page. On the planning sheet, I provided space for three primary colors and three accent colors. Of course, if you wanted more, you could always copy and paste to add another row. There are all sorts of amazing resources out there to help you pick out colors for your site. We're going to go through the four I have linked here on the planning page. Word of caution before we get started, colors and fonts can easily become rabbit holes. Sometimes I have to set a timer for myself so I don't spend hours on this part of the process. The first link I provided is for Canva. Now, one feature that I really like from Canva is their color wheel. This is an interactive tool to help you choose color combinations. To get started, you need to choose what type of color combination you're looking for. Then simply click and drag any of the circles until you find a color combination that you like. Additionally, under color meanings, Canva provides you with amazing resources to help you learn more about color theory and meaning. The second link, Adobe Color Wheel, is very similar to Canva. You can choose which type of color combination you're looking for, then click and drag one of the circles to select your colors. Like Canva, Adobe also has an extract tool, which allows you to identify the colors in an image and save them as a color palette. This tool is amazing if you're wanting to design your site theme around a specific image or photo. Coolers.co is another great resource for exploring color palettes and getting inspiration. I've talked about this resource in several videos. It's one of my favorites, but again, it's got very similar features to the first two sites. It doesn't matter which resource you use, simply pick one you feel most comfortable with. Finally, I want to highlight a Chrome extension called Colorzilla. This extension allows you to identify the exact color of any image in your browser. I love this extension and use it all the time. Let me demonstrate how it works. Start by clicking on the eyedropper, then click pick color from page. Move your cursor until it's over the color you want to pick and click and it will copy the hex code to your clipboard. A hex code is an alphanumeric code for a color and all four of these options are going to provide you with them. You can keep track of your final color choices by storing them on your planning page. To begin, type your hex code or paste it into the gray box. I'm gonna use the one we grabbed with Colorzilla. You can then change the color of the cell above the hex code so you can visually see your color palette. Begin by clicking in the cell, then click on the paint bucket and click the plus button. Paste or type in your hex code and click OK. On to our second rabbit hole, fonts. If you create a custom theme for your site, you can set a font style for the titles and headings and a font style for body text. You can get even more granular than that, but I highly suggest not putting more than three different fonts on your site. Your font should also stay consistent from page to page, providing a sense of continuity in the way your site looks and feels. If you're a font nerd like me, then you should definitely check out this link. This page features four different infographics all about font psychology and the different emotions fonts communicate. I found the information 
absolutely fascinating, but enough of that. Let's get back to font resources. This first resource is one I wish I had found out about sooner. Fonts.google.com is a library of all of Google's fonts, but what I really like about it is that you can type in custom text and preview what it will look like for each font. Sometimes I'll think I'll have found the perfect font, but when I type out my text, I won't like how some of the letters look. You also have several filter options to help you narrow down your choices. The next two links are collections of Google font pairings, and they only feature fonts that can be found in Google, which means all of them will be options on your site. I'll be honest, I really struggle with pairing fonts, so I'm really grateful for people who've put in the time on sites like these. The first site allows you to sort by style and mood. So if you want your site to have more of a modern feel, you can filter by only modern fonts. The second site not only has font pairings, but all the text is editable, which means that you're able to see how your text will look in the different font combinations. Again, you can store your final choices on your planning page. Simply type in your font names, then change the sample text to reflect your chosen font style and size. The final section on the planning page is about your brand image, which includes your site logo and favicon. Your logo is an image that's added to the left of your site name, and a favicon is the little icon that appears next to the website name on a tab. For simplicity's sake, I tend to make my logo and favicon exactly the same. Because these branding images are small, it's best to go simple and for something that's easily recognizable. You could use an image like your Bitmoji or something as simple as the initial of your last name. One resource I found when I was researching for this section is called favicon.io. This site allows you to quickly generate favicons from text, images, or emojis. Thanks for joining the Educate community today. I hope this video helped you get a jump start on planning your website. Be sure to check out our next video to learn about all the ins and outs for building your site. If you're interested in more tips and tutorials on all things EdTech, be sure to visit our channel. Also, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so you'll be notified each time we post new content. See you next time.